avoidance. And we have camouflage. For example, the eastern comma it's sitting on some scat. So it looks like a dead leaf, basically. So that works out pretty well. On some of them, they have these big eye spots, like on this eastern buckeye. And so they might keep the wings closed and open them all of a sudden. And the predator sees all these eyes. They think, oh, it's something trying to eat me and gives them paws or they turn away or something and gives um, butterfly or moth. Moths have these a lot too, of course. It gives them time to escape. A really cool one, though, one of our most common butterflies is this little eastern tail blue, which is a little tiny guy. You see it necked around clover a lot and their lawn and everything. And it has, it's a, a gossamer wing. So gossamer wings have these little white line around the eye and they're usually pretty small and everything. But they have these sort of stripy antenna, which breaks up the outlining antenna. But then this really strong pattern on the hind wing. See these orange spots, black spots, and these little tails. So when a bird looks at that, and also they'll take their hind wings and sort of move them like that. So it makes a little antennas go back and forth. And so a predator looking at this, because this is sort of not very apparent and sort of instructed. It sees this moving. It thinks this is the head and this is the, you know, the back of it. So you'll see a lot of butterflies with a little wedge bitten out of their hind wings. And that's a bird's beak. They went after the hind wings here instead of the head there. So they get a mouthful of wing and the butterfly flies away. Butterflies can fly with the most beat up wings you can imagine half gone, but they can still fly. So that's that's one of the ways that these guys will really survive, which is very interesting. The other way, we're talking about this, some, we're looking at the, um, the butterflies in the case here. And in West Virginia and Appalachian in general, we have some really um, extensive mimicry going on for predator avoidance. So we have the pipeline swallowtail. One of our swallowtails electric blue hind wings on the male, these little white spots. Underneath is a lot of orange, we'll see that a little bit later. But it feeds on pipe vine, which is a native vine, grows up in trees, that has toxins associated with it. But like monarch butterflies, it, they um, bioaccumulate the toxins in their body, and so they're very distasteful. These are one of the ones that, you know, the bird eats it and it throws it right back up again. So all these species that occur within the pipeline swallowtail's range mimic this guy. We have the red-spotted admiral, which is not a swallowtail, but is very common. Black swallowtail female, spicebush swallowtail, which is one of the common forest species. Black swallowtails occur more in fields. The eastern swallowtail female, and the Diana frillary female, which occurs down in the southern part of the state like around here. Outside of the range of the pipe vine, this one has the male coloration, which is the typical tiger swallowtail, yellow and black. But within the pipeline swallowtail's range, typically the females are this dark color. So that mimicry, even though these guys all taste fine and dandy, because this one is so distasteful, that mimicry protects these guys. Which is very cool. Is pipe vine Aristolochia? Yes. Has the funky little pipe the clouds and heart shape. big heart shape in his head. Okay. <laughs> We're not doing a 10 minute break, but I like the photos. I like cartoons. Okay. This is one of our special butterflies. We're all talking about the tiger swallowtail. I guess that's the tiger swallowtail in the east, but we actually have two species. One is the eastern tiger swallowtail, and one is this guy, which is the Appalachian. We have our own tiger swallows. It is much larger. It's an early spring flyer. has these really long hind wings. And it's about a third again bigger than the typical spring flying eastern tiger swallow. And it's up in high elevation. So find the other ones. So we're going to get that. that. Okay. 
So how do you identify these guys? Again, going back, identifying the families is one of the easiest things to do. <laughs> Swallowtails, you know, general to Pacific. Swallowtails, they're big. They have these broad, angular wings and the swallow tails on the back. Swallowtails are probably our easiest species or group to identify the family. Um, all of them, the zebra swallowtail is maybe a little less common than the other ones, but all of them are very commonly seen in their habitat. Most of them, except for the black swallowtail, fly through forests or looking for like Joe Pye weed, for example, they fly along roadsides and trails. Black swallowtail is more restricted to sort of open areas. They especially like like alfalfa and hay fields and such like that. The whites and the sulfurs, white or yellow. Um, cabbage whites are an exotic European species that was accidentally introduced. It loves to chew on broccoli and cabbage, cauliflower and things like that. It is white with little black spots on the wings. All the other ones are native. A very common spring flying one is falcate orange tip. There's a lot of orange tips out west. This is our eastern eastern one. Has a little, you know, vermiculite sort of wing, meaning worm-like markings, little squiggly markings on the hind wing. White, and the males, not the females, but the males have this bright orange tip to the wing. There's another similar one called the Olympia marble, which is another rare species that we thought was extirpated. But one of my volunteers found it in Putnam County, so I was happy about that. And they look fairly similar, but without the orange. And this markings are less wormy and a sort of metallic gold color, with a little bit of greenish tinge to them, so they're quite pretty. But they're early spring flyers as well. And then the sulfurs. These are our two common ones. Clouded sulfur is just yellow, these dark edgings on the male. And this is a female orange sulfur. They're much oranger. And but the females have these little markings in that black border with the spots. But the tricky thing about sulfurs is that both the clouded sulfur and orange sulfur can have a white female form. <laughs> and you can't tell them apart. You just have to say all the female of one of these species. And it's thought that they develop more quickly, but they, um, they, do, they can develop more quickly. So the males like that better, so they tend to mate with them more. But something counteracts that. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. Those are some. Then we get into the gossamer wings. Um, we have hair streaks. You know, here there's a little tail on the hair streak, and they'll do the same thing that the eastern tail blue would do with you know do the antenna thing and mm -hmm. use it as a decoy. So they do that. There's this entire tail blue again. Coral hair streaks, and these guys are often forest species. Many of the gossamer wings are canopy species, and so we have not been able to um, detect them in the numbers I would like because. They're up in the you know, tops of the 60-foot tree. And they're just little guys. They're really hard to see. Um, so some of them we just haven't found very much of. And I just have to assume that they're still here. There's no reason why they shouldn't be. Gray hair streaks are one of the ones that are down lower, so we've gotten plenty of those. Corals, not so much. We see a lot of brown elephants. They occur more around the eastern panhandle and like piney, oaky sort of areas. The eastern tail blues are ubiquitous. This is a good one to learn because it is just everywhere. I'm sure it's still raining, but if it wasn't raining, we'd be out there <laughs> flying around. The males are dark blue on the dorsal surface. The females are sort of darker, sort of blackish. All the gossamer wings sit with the wings like this. When they perch, they don't open them up unless they need to suck. So this is, remember, I was talking about how, maybe it was last night, but when you're identifying butterflies, you need to see both the dorsal surface and the ventral surface of the wings. Typically speaking, it's good to know that because you get clues from both. These guys, usually the dorsal surface is unremarkable. So luckily, the ventral surface has all the good stuff going on. Except for the azures. The 
picked the wrong program. Taxonomy for butterflies, to a large extent, has been fairly stable, but we're discovering new cryptic species frequently. The spring azure was the typical azure you would find back in the 60s. That was the only azure that we had. Now we have six other species of azure that occur in the state because they've teased out that, oh, this is two species. Oh, this is another, this is another species, and this is another species. So we have a total of six or seven azures that occur in the state. They all are pale underneath and have blue wings. But there's certain small differences. For example, spring azures on the dorsal surface, besides the typical scales, the little scales that you see, they have little tiny translucent scales between those scales. So you have to use a magnifying group in order to see those to identify. And they often overlap in their flights. So spring azures are very early. We have another one called a northern azure that flies with the spring azure. And there's also the summer azure that has a spring boot that flies with the spring azure. <laughs> <laughs> this time of year, we have see the spring azure is done, the northern azure is done, but we have the cherry gall azure and the Appalachian azure and the summer azure. So anyways, it can get a little calm. I'm not going to tell you how to identify these because I have an expert who doesn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Um, let's see, bronze copper. We have three species of copper, the American copper, the bronze, and the bog copper that we met a little bit earlier. Um, the bronze copper is one of our rare species that needs sort of old fields, waste areas, like scrubby sort of weedy type patches in order to survive. And that's one species that's actually um, declined range-wide because things are getting all cleaned up and you don't have like the fallow fields you used to have with the agriculture and such. So we do have, um, we do find this in like some places in Putnam County and especially up in the northern Panhandle actually, which is kind of nice. So those are our gospel, all gospel wings. Also they have this white ring around the eye, which you have to get sort of close to see. But all of them have white rings around the eyes. Some of them have these the little hair streaks here and there, a little bump. Often the hind wing is sort of scalloped or um, irregular, it isn't a smooth edge, but often is. I mean, that's a pretty smooth edge. Now, I was talking about um, last night how fresh species specimens are much easier to identify. Same thing goes for butterflies. And the way you tell a fresh specimen, I mean, obviously the colors are vivid, and there's high contrast and everything, but also see, you see this little line right here on this coral hair streak. Those are actually the little modified scales. That's called the fringe. And so it's like a little fringe on the edges of the wings. When that fringe is all intact, you know you got something pretty fresh. You can see up here it's kind of ragged. This one isn't quite as fresh. It's a little bit ragged. The rest of these are pretty fresh. The harvester is a gossamer wing. It used to be in its own group, but they stuck it in there. And it's really kind of cool because the larvae is carnivorous. No other butterfly in Eastern North America has this. So if you get, especially alder, you find this on alder a lot, you get these woolly aphids that infest the alder. They're a native species, it's okay. It's just one of the things that happens. Harvesters lay their eggs on the woolly aphids. Here's a female laying eggs on the woolly aphids. And the caterpillar right here eats the woolly aphids, which is very cool. It sticks the bodies, or the you know, detritus from its meal on its back, so it's sort of camouflaged like the woolly aphids. And ants really like aphids, because they get honeydew from the aphids and everything. But the, um, so the ant is investigating this adult but the larvae can produce a little bit of honeydew, so it feeds the ants as well, so it doesn't get attacked by the ants. But the, then the adult comes in and actually nectars off the honeydew on the aphids as well. So it's this little interesting community going on here. Um, and most butterflies this size, it'll take like, you know, you're going to have four to six to seven days as an egg, a week or two as a larvae, adult's going to last a couple of weeks. These guys are accelerated, maybe because they have such a protein-rich diet, but they can go through a complete life cycle in less than a month, from egg to adult. 
through through the adult stage. So these go very quickly. So they have several more generations per year during the growing, growing season, and a lot of our native butterflies that have multiple broods. So. so if you get a really good stand of alders, sort of poke around a little bit. See if you can find some of these woolly aphids and keep an eye on them. You might see the harvesters. They're pretty common in the state, but they're um, localized by that food source. This is our metal mark, which we have one family, um, Rionidae. We have them down in the gorge. Um, one of the few places we have them. There's a few other places. Oh, Stone Cold Wildlife Management Area, and there's a few other places around the state that we have them. But they're quite rare. Um, they've declined. They're called metal marks because they have this sort of metallic, steel blue metallic markings on the wings. Out west, there's a whole suite of different species of metal marks. There are all many, many different species out there. We just have. In the eastern United States, we have a few species. This is the only one that occurs in North America. There's a swamp metal mark, and there's another metal mark sort of in the Midwest. They're small. They feed on a little plant, um, one of the pussy toes, not the pussy toes, Aboveda. Seneco Aboveda. I can't remember the common name. It's a little, it's a little, it's a little thing. It occurs sort of on rocky, sandy sort of habitat. Um, Sexes look alike. They don't have the white ring around the eye, which one that separates them from the gossamer ones. But they're quite similar to them. They're, they're little tiny guys. And we get into the brushfoots. This is that big family that's very diverse. So we'll look first at the fritillaries. These are these orange and black butterflies that are quite common. Great spangled are ones that they're out now. They're sort of big and orange and black. They have a broad on the, on the surface. This is an Atlantis. But on the Great Spangled, this yellow line in there is quite broad on the sky. There's another one called the Aphrodite Fulleri, where it starts broad and peters out. And then there's the Atlantis, which occurs at high elevations, where it's narrow. But it also has blue eyes. These guys have sort of yellowish and orangey eyes. So this is the blue-eyed Highlander, and these guys that hey, they occur statewide, so they can be Highlands too. A small one is a metal fritillary. And again, the top side is the squiggly little orange and black markings. But underneath it sort of looks like marbled paper. Sort of that mottled pearl pearlescent sort of look to it. And then our southern fritillary, which is quite rare in the state. We don't have as many records as I would like to have. And there's very strongly sexually dimorphic. Remember, the female Diana fritillary mimics the pipeline. So the male has this broad orange edging, the female sort of bluish. And underneath, most other fritillaries have these white markings or complex markings on the bottom. They're just sort of plain underneath, plain orangish and plain sort of bluish gray. How strange is that for one sex of a species to use mimicry and the other sex not be used? Now we have at least two species, the eastern tiger swallowtail and, the, and this one. And is it always the female that exhibits the, the, the mimicry? Typically, because the males are usually the flashier ones to sort of attract the females. Right. So usually the female is more cryptic, and that occurs across many tracks. Yeah. How big is the wingspan on that diamond for the literary weapon? Three inches? That big. It's good size. Wow. It's a big butterfly. And they occur um, mountaintop removal mining and mining in general. This occurs in, in the southern third of West Virginia and also in Kentucky and then, um, Virginia, has some Tennessee, and sort of down to North Carolina. And then there's another population out in the Ozarks. But these guys, because of mountaintop removal mining, has impacted their habitat. All fritillaries need violence. All fritillaries are larval host as well. And so as you have um, impacts to the forests and the forest floor and everything, they lose habitat. And they seem to need broad expanses of intact forest, um, broad expanses of violets and everything. So you need a more 
little blue sort of habitat for them to some extent. But they need a lot of nectar. They're long-lived. All these guys are pretty long-lived. Um, uh, great Spangled Fritillaries, the males emerge first um, in late May into June. The females are going to start emerging in a week or two probably, give or take, for most of these. Um, Fritillaries are a little bit more, uh, later. They, they're sort of into July. And then the um, the mate, males die. The females will last until frost. They live all summer. So they need a, a, a ongoing um, concentration of nectar sources throughout the summertime. And I think that's what may be happening with these especially, is that there's not the nectar sources. Then you have the crescents and the checker spots. So you have the frillaries. Now, crescents and checker spots. So this is the northern crescent we met earlier. With the, the males have the orange and tenor palms. We have what's called a summer crescent, which is a little bit smaller and doesn't fly quite at the same time. And they have orange and tenor palms. This is the pearl crescent, which is ubiquitous across the state. Almost any little orange and black butterfly you find is going to be this guy. Um, and you can see it's for this one. See the line on the hind wing goes all the way across, and it's not a big expanse of orange without some line across it. And this one, see, it's a larger expanse of orange, and on this guy, it's very subtle gestalty sort of thing. I send these guys away to experts to confirm. I try, but just to confirm, so our data set is accurate. Um, silvery checker spots initially look a lot like these, but see, you have open circles on the hind wings here. Well, these are just solid little circles of black, little dots of black, and these have white in them. And the underside is quite different. To me, it looks like, see the little curved shapes here? It looks like a little cartoon hand on the hind wing. <laughs> and at higher elevations, we have the Harris checker spot, which is much, it looks much darker, there's a lot more black on it. And underneath, all the spots are very angular, but a lot of contrast with and those you'll find like in Canadian Valley and in the Blackwater and all over the place up there, well, in Pocahontas more County down the mountains. They have an, a particular aster that they um, that is the larval host. And they actually, instead of having in this guy and also the Baltimore <coughs> checker spot, which we'll a little bit later, these guys, instead of, you know, the female just laying one egg on a plant, she lays a whole bunch of eggs and the larvae have a colony on the plant and they actually wrap themselves in the web sort of like a tough caterpillar for these guys, for the hairs checkers, for, for the chips on these checker spots. Silvery checker spot don't do it. They do it individually, but two species we have to do. So those are some of the orange and black ones. And angle wings. Commas and morning cloaks. Morning cloaks are one of our earliest flying butterflies because all of these overwinter as adults. Most of our butterflies overwinter as eggs, larvae, or pupa, um, or chrysalises. These guys all overwinter as adults. These are the ones if you see in garden catalogs or garden centers, you see a butterfly house. That's what supposed to be easier for. Out west, they actually sort of use them because of that resource may be a little bit limiting. Here in West Virginia, there are so many wood piles and dead wood and cracks and crevices and everything. They never get used except by wasps. Um, these guys really don't use them. So we see morning cloaks, you have this deep, deep violet, maroony color with the blue and the gold, unmistakable. One of the most wonderful, wonderful things to see in the, in the springtime. Question mark and eastern comma are quite similar. Commas have the little comma shape. That's where the name comes from, right there. Question mark has the comma and a dot, so it looks like a question mark. On the surface, this has one, two, three dots right there. And this actually made the two color phases. This may be black or orange. On the question mark, they have one, two, three, four, because there's a vein that splits this last dot in half on the question mark right there. Then the green comma often has sort of green edging, has the comma shape, and is more frilly. The edges of the wings are more frilly. And this, again, is to mimic dead leaves when they're perched up on a little twig or something, it looks just like a dead leaf. 
and morning cloaks the same way, except it's very gray on the back. And before I go any further, make sure I tell you about this book. The best butterfly book that I've found so far. Butterflies of Indiana. <laughs> one of the uh, pluses of this, there's lots of little butterfly books. I gave you this one, and that, that, that would be good for if you're just starting out. But one of the most difficult um, groups to identify are skippers. So this does a really, really, really good job on skippers. And it hits most of the other, pretty much almost all the other butterflies we have. So, and it's pretty inexpensive. It's on Amazon. Check it out. You said the morning cloak over winters as an adult? Yeah, all these dogs do. And so would we still be seeing morning cloaks flying around now or they finished up for the season? The overwintering population has died. Right. The they've laid eggs, and the larvae will be hatching out. Or probably they already hatched out, um, and maybe actually pupated. What all these guys do, to a large extent, especially the morning cloak, they'll be active in the spring. The new right. generation is produced in the spring. Then they they'll estivate or be sort of inactive during the, the hottest parts of the summer, mm -hmm. like you know, July and August. You won't see much of these at all. But in the fall, you start seeing them again. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And then you have the typical brush foots that don't, you can't stick them in any other sort of category. So painted ladies, we have two different types, American and painted ladies. This is the painted lady that, on the top, they look pretty similar. Let's see, they got one, two, three, four little eye spots on the hind wing. You can sort of see that there. On the other painted lady, there's just two. So looking at those little details is what you look for. Buckeye, which is a, um, for example, the Buckeye, the American Snout, are two which don't overwinter in West Virginia. They all die. But they repopulate the north from the southern populations down along the Gulf Coast, for example, every year. So they come into the state every year. We have several other species that do that as well. Red spotted admiral, which is very common. They got maroon spots on the hind wing. We have two emperors, the tawny emperor and the hackberry emperor, sort of the brown with eye spots. And of course the monarch, which is a truly migratory species. Then we have the browns and satyrs, which is little brown jobs. They're like sparrows. Um, curly eyes are a forest species. We have all these eye spots with little dots in them. We have, actually that should be a spring satyr. Let me update this. This is being split into two species, the little wood satyr, which occurs rarely in the state we discovered, and something called the spring satyr, which is much more common. So this is going to be, as an, it isn't official yet, but it will happen eventually. Carolina satyr, which is very similar, but notice, this has two eye spots on the forewing, and actually you can see the eye spots on the dorsal surface as well. On the Carolina satyr, it just has these eye spots on the hind wing, and just little tiny ones on the forewing. And the dorsal surface is all dark, no eye spot showing. The, these are both flying right now. Well, the spring satyr is. They're quite common. They both feed on, on the larva hosts or grasses. You'll see them a little, see them along the woods edge and little lady areas and such, especially. And they all see this one, Appalachian Brown, Gem Sater, come with them. They all have this thing where they sort of, you know, they flap and then they sort of glide with the wings like that. And flap and they glide. So it's this, this, this little bouncy thing. And you see these wings, it's like it looks like the wings are closed and it's just bouncing along. Um, Appalachian brown is this warm, lovely, fawny brown sort of color. They, we thought there was, these were quite rare and just up in the higher elevations, but it turns out they're really, I found them all over the state to a large extent, but really sort of wet meadow, lady sort of areas. I love, I love moisture. Wood nymphs are this very dark color. Gem satyrs are sort of dry, oaky, piney areas. It's one of our rarer species has this little metallic gem sort of look on the hind wing. And, oh, brushfoots. Brushfoots are called brushfoots because, look at this Appalachian brown. 
you just see two pairs of legs there. The brush foot is a small, there's a little foreleg up here, and they just use it for grooming. So it doesn't use its front pair of legs for locomotion at all. It doesn't walk on it. So that's why they're called brush foots. I apologize, I didn't mean to talk to you about that. And that's how you can tell this whole family is because that little, you see it walking around, you just see two pairs of legs, it's going to be a brush foot. All the other ones use all the legs. Then we get into the skippers, little brown jobs. So you have the open wing skippers. When they stop flying and rest, the wings are held open like an airplane. Most of them are shades of brown with subtle markings. If you don't have fresh specimens of this, it's going to be really tough. Juvenile's dusky wing, on the underside of the hind wing, you'll see two small white dots. And that's, a, that's the best key for that one. This is a spring flyer. Many of these are spring flyers. Um, they, you might see some old ones right now, but they're pretty much done. Males and females, males tend to, all well, these tend to look darker and less contrasting. Females often have, the markings are more apparent because there's more contrast associated with them. Wild indigo dusky wing is an interesting story. They used to be really rare because the only thing they ate was wild dusky, wild indigo, which is like wild baptisia. Then they adapted to crown hedge. And now they're all over the place. This one you'll see a little bit in the spring. You can see a dusky wing, something that looks sort of like this in the middle of summer. That's what it's going to be, because they'll, they'll fly all summer long. The other ones, mostly all, all the other dusky ones, are just pretty much spring flyers, except for horses a little bit. They sort of look like a genius. The cloudy wings don't have the complicated pattern that the dusky wings do. They're just little white flecks. We have two different species, northern and southern cloudy wing. And these I often find at woods edges, um, slash piles, um, <coughs> logging roads, things like that. Seem to like sort of disturb woody sort of areas with you know a fair amount of low vegetation. Common checkered skipper is related to the grizzled skipper we talked about earlier, and they used to be much more common. They um, their range has contracted a lot in West Virginia, and also range wide. They're like sort of waste, wasty open places. Silver spotted skipper are everywhere. They're ubiquitous, like the pearl crescent. And that's one of the most common species we always get. Big, long, pointed wings and this bright silvery white spot on the underside. Aggressive, they chase you. Um, you'll see it at nectaring. Here's nectaring on red clover, it, or nectar on a broad variety of plants. Then we have the folded wing skippers, or the branded skippers. And branded skippers, let's see if you can do Okay, this one isn't too bad. They're called branded because a lot of these, um, the fold wing skippers, have a space on their forewing that has what are called androconial cells that release scent to help attract mm -hmm. females. And they're kind of funky looking. This one you can see it slightly here. It's a little raised area of little raised, sort of brushy, looks like a brush cut on the scales. Um, this is it on this little European skipper. That's the stigma right there. And unfortunately, the rest of them, this is a female, so it doesn't show up. But you can see, see how this wing is sort of horizontal. This comes up at a 45 degree angle, and here as well. So if you see something sitting on a plant or something that sort of looks like that, that's going to be one of these fold wing skippers, or branded skippers, because they hold their wings at the sort of fighter jet type of these skippers also demonstrating this and done a little glass here. If you're photographing skippers, that's the best way to do it because you can get the um, top of both the forewing and the hindwing in one shot, which can be very helpful for identification. For a lot of skippers, the underside of the hindwing is diagnostic, so it's still good to get them in this pose and in this pose because you have to put the two together to get the idea. You can see the hooked sort of um, sickle-shaped antenna on them. You can see the little hook right there. And, um, <coughs> see, that's really apparent here. See the hook on that? So all the skippers have this sort of sickle-shaped club on the end of their antenna. And that's how you can build through the skippers and the other butterflies. OK. Skippers.
skippers have often you know, crescent or delta shaped rows of spots, um, glassy spots like on here, sometimes no spots at all, usually orange and brown coloration. So they're not, it's like sparrows or warblers. Once you know what you're looking for, you can identify them, but it can be a little bit challenging sometimes because they're little and they are, um, you have to look at small details to identify them. Oh, and these are the back of the moths. These are some of the moths. I found an eye moth last night, which is fun. Lunar moths are flying. You might, if it clears up, we'll do moths tonight. Actually got some somewhere. Last night didn't work like that. So. Uh, these are some of the hawk moths. This is a hummingbird pluming. And you can see the hawk moths have these long, narrow fore wings and little small hind wings. Right there. You can see that on the moths face as well. This is one of the our day flyers as well. Especially most of my records from this have come from the Eastern Tank. And those are rare ones. Uh, these are some day fly ones. I found an Atlantis webworm, which feeds on Tree of Heaven, um, hence the name Atlantis, which is the genus of Tree of Heaven. Bluish spring moth, which are little fluttery white things you see flying ahead of you on, on trails. Um, Tachina moth, and forester moths. And there are other ones as well. You also have what are called clear wing moths, which is just a family of moths called clear wing moths. It's mostly common. I've never actually seen one. This is from, I grabbed off the web. Um, squash vine more. If you have zucchini and you get the borer into it, that's what that's who's doing it. But I never do see them. I'm supposed to be day flying And this is the Appalachian, oh, good. Appalachian tiger swallowtail. Here you can see the difference. Here's the Easter. Here's the Affy. So you can see this really broad band of light blue. It's much narrower here and long wing. The summer eastern tiger swallowtail looks a lot like the Appy, but it's well beyond when these guys are flying. So it's just the summer brood of the easterns are little and darker. These are much paler yellow. So if you're ever up in the mountains, and here's, here's an eastern and there's an Appy, so you can see the size difference. Mm -hmm. So if the mountains in the spring, take a look for these. It's Oh, here's the azure complex. I did have this, good. Here's the spring azure, and then these are all, oh, I had dusky azure too. These are all the other ones. This one's split in two. Northern azure has some more pigmentation on the, on the ventral surface. I can't identify cherry gall azures. I let my expert do it. I have not figured that one out. Summer azures have this really bright white, and then the dorsal <coughs> surface also has a lot of white on it. So that one I can. Appalachian azures are about a third larger of anything else, so the size difference is pretty apparent. Springs have those little funky scales in between the regular scales, and duskies are quite dark. Don't, I didn't find any duskies up in the mountains. They, I don't know where they are. And this is the crescent. It's been at the northern crescent, and then the summer crescent. Which the summer crescent, it turns out we have another species, based from my expert, he said this that the actual summer crescents are further east and Appalachians have a special crescent. So I don't know what's going to happen. And that we don't need to do. So I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. I hope I didn't confuse you too much.